Konnichiwa. Today, we're going to talk about the most important single transition in the process of acquiring Japanese, and that is the leap from learning about Japanese, learning structure and things like that, to actually immersing in the language, which in organic Japanese we do a lot earlier than in other methods. Now, if you've been following my core structure course, you've probably noticed already that there's not very much there in the way of drills and exercises and things like that as compared to other courses like Genki or that sort of thing. I did a couple of worksheets for the very early segments in order to get some of those most basic concepts firm in our minds. I did a video on a particular piece of software that helps us to drill verb transitions and explained how to use that in the light of organic theory. But on the whole, we don't do very much of this kind of thing. And I don't believe that exercises and drills and stilted conversations to practice what we learned in the last chapter really do very much good. The idea in organic Japanese is that what we use to consolidate our theoretical learning is actual practical immersion experience in Japanese. But the problem there is, how do we make that transition? Where we know a little bit of vocabulary, some structure, a few kanji, how do we make that transition into actually using Japanese? Let me explain how organic theory works. What I liken it to is a very complex game and the user manual. Now this is a very complex game. Let's imagine a deep strategy game where there's tons and tons of information about all the equipment you're going to use, the strategies and tactics you're going to use, the nature of your enemies, the nature of your allies, lots and lots of information. With a game like that, you actually need a manual. You need to be able to read it at night when you're not playing the game and work out how everything fits together. Now, if you have a game like that, and a manual like that, what do you do? Do you sit down and spend a couple of weeks just reading the manual from cover to cover before you touch the game? Most of you, I think, would not do that. What you do is read the first few chapters of the manual, get the idea of how the game basically works, and then start playing it. And as you started hitting problems in the game, you go back to the manual again. Very often you'd come to places where you'd already read the manual and you'd say, I've read this in the manual, but what exactly was it that it said? And you go back to the manual, read it again, and even though you learned it the first time, now that you've encountered the problem in practice, you get more out of that reading on the second time. So we have a three-stage process there. Reading the theory, encountering the problem in practice, going back and getting more out of the theory again. And sometimes this isn't just a three-stage process. It'll be a four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten-stage process where we go from the game back to the manual, back into the game again, encounter the thing in a slightly different guise, back to the manual again, and all the time we're getting a deeper and deeper understanding of the structures, not just from the abstract structural teaching, but even more from the real encounters. Because the abstract structural teaching is just a training dummy. It's only encountering the problems in their real settings, in actual Japanese, that we really learn them, as opposed to learning about them. But the question here is, how do we make that jump when we only have a little bit of information to start with? Now, the way not to do it, the way that frustrates a lot of people, is we talk about starting with anime, and anime is one good place to start, but a lot of people will then try to jump into their favorite anime with subtle plot twists and complex characters and expect to be able to understand that. And this is really a recipe for frustration because in terms of Japanese, you're an infant. When you're wanting to read at your current level in English, you need to find in the early days material that suits the level we're at. One way of doing that is graded readers made for foreigners. The advantage of these is that they introduce vocabulary slowly and carefully so that you're not overwhelmed. If you want to try those, you can always do that. The other way, which is in some ways a little bit tougher, is going into actual native material. And I'm going to suggest and help you with a very good place to start that. 
When we're doing this, we need to bear in mind that we're probably going to need to know Desu Masu Japanese. Now, I deliberately don't introduce this until lesson 17, because it just confuses your grasp of the basic language if you start learning it too early, the way most of the textbooks encourage you to do. But I wouldn't start trying to immerse until at least the first 20 lessons, perhaps the first 30, it depends how confident you are. But definitely we need to get past Desu Masu, because graded readers will all use it, because that's the way it's taught to beginners, unfortunately. And real native material is very likely to use it, because if we're looking at very simple things like fairy tales, they will tend to use Desu Masu speech. If at all possible, where there is native speaker audio. Because if we're just reading, what we're doing is we're taking our initial impressions of Japanese sounds, which are given to us by Romaji equivalents. So if we're reading this in our heads, we're going to be reading it in a Romaji accent, as it were. And it's very important to hear it in actual Japanese. It's also important because, as well as just reading material at the beginning, we should also be hearing it. In fact, whenever we're not reading it, we should be hearing it, if at all possible. With a phone or an iPod or whatever, you can be hearing it all the time. You actually don't need to be hearing anything else. This gets you used to hearing spoken Japanese. It consolidates the new vocabulary that you're learning. It consolidates the structures in your mind. This is the way structure is really going to get ingrained in your mind, not through drills. Partly through working it out as you go through the text, but very much through hearing it again and again and again on your own audio. So, I'm going to look at something that answers all these requirements. Now, this is a very good site called Fukumusume, and the story here is Snow White. The advantage of this is that you know it already. When we look at this page, you'll see that there are two audio files. You can download them, you just have to press that little three dots hamburger button and download the file. The one I recommend is the second one, because it doesn't have any music, which makes it easier to hear clearly. It's nice, clear, slow reading style. It may seem a bit fast to you at first, but believe me, it's much, much easier than standard Japanese speech. So, are you ready to jump in? Let's test it right now. Let's look at some of the text and see if you can make anything of it. I'll hold your hand through these first parts. Mukashi Mukashi, Tottemo Utsukushi Keredo, Kokoro no Minikui Okisaki ga imashita. Mukashi Mukashi, Tottemo Utsukushi Keredo, Kokoro no Minikui Okisaki ga imashita. Now, did you get that? Mukashi Mukashi, is the way many fairy stories start. It literally means long ago, long ago, but it's the equivalent of the English once upon a time. Totemo utsukushi karedo. Totemo, I think you know, is very. This is stressed a bit by saying totemo rather than just totemo. Utsukushi is beautiful. Karedo is a form of kedo, which means but. So, a long time ago, once upon a time, a very beautiful but. Kokoro no minikui. Kokoro is hard. Minikui means literally hard to look at or ugly. Kokoro no minikui gives us a contrast here, doesn't it? Whoever we're talking about is beautiful, but her heart is ugly. Kokoro no minikui is an adjectival way of saying kokoro ga minikui. Heart is ugly, and I'll put a link to where I've talked about that. No, which means ga. Kokoro no minikui okisaki ga imashita. No, imasu is the masu form of iru. I, you take off the ru because it's a etiram verb and put on masu. Okisaki, kisaki means a queen or an empress. And the o, of course, is honorific. So what we have here is, a long time ago, a beautiful but ugly-hearted queen existed. Or as we say in English, once upon a time, there was a beautiful but ugly-hearted queen. Now did you get that? How much of that explanation did you need? Could you have worked it out by yourself? 
。お木先は魔法の鏡を持っていて、いつも魔法の鏡に尋ねます。鏡よ、鏡よ。この世で一番美しいのは誰おきさきは、鏡がいつものように、あなたが一番美しいです。と、答えるのを待ちました。おきさきは、魔法の鏡を持っていて、いつも魔法の鏡に、尋ねます。The queen had a magic mirror and 持っている is being a state of holding that iru itself is in her form in order to end one clause and lead into the second clause of a compound sentence and a link to the less non-compound sentences above my head and in the information section below. The queen possessed A magic mirror and いつも魔法の鏡に尋ねます。いつも always. The magic mirror, she asks. 尋ねる is to ask, so she always asks the magic mirror. Now, in Japanese stories, we don't need to have everything in the past tense, even when the narrative is a past tense narrative. And this 尋ねます this non-past tense, It's telling us that this is something that generally happens, not something that happens on one particular occasion in the present, the future, or the past, but something that generally happens. She's always asking her magic mirror. What's she asking? Kagami yo, kagami yo. Kono sekai de ichiban utsukushi no wa dare. Okisaki wa kagami ga itsumo no yoi ni. あなたが一番美しいです。と答えるのを待ちました。So, can you pass this out? Can you understand what's going on here? What she asked is in the square quotation marks. She asked, as for the most beautiful person in this world, who? And that's the question. Who is the most beautiful person in this world? And if you don't understand why de is after この世界、この世界で、一番美しい、the most beautiful in the world. I'll put a link to the video where I've explained that. おきさきは、かがみが、いつものように、みょう、means a likeness. And I'll link to the place where I talked about that. So, いつものように、literally means, the likeness of always. So let's leave out the queen at the beginning here for the moment. The same as always, it's the mono yoni, the likeness of always. あなたが一番美しいです。You are the most beautiful. と答える。So this whole section here means the mirror, the same as always, answers you are the most beautiful. But then it says no o machimashita. No puts that whole section Into a no box, I'll link to videos where we've talked about the no box, puts that whole section into a no box and tells us then, going right back to the beginning of that sentence, what the queen did about it. She waited for it. And I wonder what will happen next. Do you think she'll get what she's waiting for or do you think she'll get something else? Now, I just did this really so that you can take a look at this level of text. Which is quite a simple level, but as you see, even quite simple text has some things that we really have to think about and parse out. Once you've got this, whether with my help or without it, what you need to do is take the section of the recording that you've been able to understand up to this point and put that on your iPod or your phone and listen to it again and again and again because this is the part that gets you To really understand and internalize it. Now, if people want me to go through more of this story, I may do so. So let me know in the comments below if you do. If you have other questions about how to go about making this transition, please put them in the comments below and 
I will answer as usual. I'd like to thank my gold Kokeshi patrons, my producer angels, for helping us to find our way into the depths of Japanese language. And I'd like to thank all my patrons and supporters because all of you are my producer angels who are making all this possible. And I'd like to thank you for attending this lesson. Kore karamo, yoroshiku onegaishimasu. Class dismissed.